see if we're live here, if people are seeing us. Hey everyone, Mike Rosart here for the Wise Wealth Show. Sorry I'm a couple minutes late, doing the Facebook, doing the Instagram live streams, letting everyone know that I am going live. I will always make it out for you guys unless I am dying. Right now I got a, a bit of a sickness, not super sick, but just feeling kind of down and kind of drained. Um, let me know guys if I am streaming live right now. Let's let's see, can anyone see? Your internet is totally live. Can people, people on? Yeah, I think I'm on. Let's see, start streaming. Sound sounds okay. You can see me, cool. Can we turn up the volume just a tad? Is it too quiet? Are we okay? Hey, 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 hey. Um, hey, everyone. Sounds okay? Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, everyone, we are live. The first minute is always just technical, stuff like that. Hey, Tommy. Hey, Montour, how you doing? Patel, Rick, how you doing, guys? Good to see you all on. We've got the chat popped out, and I am streaming live to you guys. Let me know if the video and audio is in sync. We've made some more slight tweaks. Uh, it's a tad quiet still, okay. Can I adjust the volume any louder? Mm -hmm. Is it better if I adjust it higher? We got the mixer. Let's turn the mixer up all the way. Hey, how's it going? Ellie, how you doing? Where at? Okay. You guys hear me loud and clear? Yeah? yeah? Everyone hear me? Is it better? Should I talk louder? We can close the door to the office. I can just talk a little bit louder. Hey, Sayed, how you doing? Good to see everyone on. Um, so today we're gonna do a little bit of a de live deal analysis on the computer. There, we'll pick we'll pick a, uh, a, a real life property. We'll just analyze it, and have some fun. I haven't opened up my Excel, so you're gonna have to bear with me when I open that up and get everything kind of going for everyone. But before everyone says audio is good, then Watson says talk a little louder. Okay, we're gonna talk about real estate, Sky. Yes, we're gonna talk about real estate. Of course we are. So what have I been up to in the last week? I've been up to a ton of cool stuff. The boardroom is officially set up. We got the back office, the big 10 person boardroom table, the fireplace, the whole nine yards. We've been having meetings with a few key individuals trying to build what I call the core power team. So I'm trying to build a core power team. I want to surround myself with five powerhouse people. And my business partner on right way management is one of those people. Um, got some other key people. Uh, Kyle here is one of the key people on the power team. It's going to be a, a team of people that basically are the power team. And we're going to just crush life. We're going to crush the world. And it's going to go from zero to 100 million uh, in five years. So that's, that's the goal. I don't even think it's unrealistic. The, the fact that like we're crushing one deal a week is just a start. Like buying a property a week is just a start in the company. We need to be doing two, three, four, five deals. Um, the acquisitions, we're basically going to blow an acquisitions division of the company to really increase the pipeline. We're looking, we've hired, we've got like a full-time maintenance guy. We've got full-time contractors, a couple of them now. And we're looking to hire, you know, another property manager and a few other key roles, an admin role. We need someone to start handling all the paperwork because things are building up. It's getting crazy. So my quick status update is life is crazy. Um, been not sleeping really great last night. I went to bed at 3:30. Woke up this morning, you know, 7:30, 8 o'clock. I'm getting messages. My, you know, our daughter wakes up early, and so I'm getting like four and five hours sleep and just grinding it from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep. Today was all about we had some windows we were installing under the Green On program, which allowed us to get basically free windows through the, the government on almost all of our properties, which is a sweet program. It's now closed, so you can't get in, into it, but there's still the Union Gas program, which gives you 5,000 rebate. I've been milking that for a long time. I did eight furnaces and got all eight furnaces on the eight properties for free. So there are tons of cool programs out there you can utilize as landlord to make your properties more efficient for your tenants and make you a little bit of money too. Because if you can get a furnace put into a unit for 250 bucks net after the rebate, that's a huge win. A repair in a furnace is often more than that. So brand new high efficiency furnace, the utility costs are huge, or utility savings are huge, rather. And so yeah, anyway, we're, we're growing. Things are going crazy. Um, start throwing in the questions there, guys. Let me know if the volume's not peaking. It looks like I, I can see on my audio display down below before it goes through uh, OBS to the stream that it's, it's not cracking. So you guys shouldn't be, it shouldn't be too loud. It should be okay. And let me know if the, the audio and video are in sync. If you have any issues at all, I would love to hear them in the comments. If you have any questions, start throwing them in the comments. We're going to do a live deal analysis, and this is going to be an hour of Hour. We're going to just bang up the questions we're going to talk about at a high level, various things related to real estate, personal finance, whatever you guys want to talk about. You want to talk about what's going on in the political environment. You guys know I think it's just noise and I ignore any short-term fluctuations because long-term things go in one direction. You have to be focused on the long-term, 
not the short term, right? Like in 2008, I wasn't focused on what was happening because I knew we'd be recovered by 2012. The same is true with rising interest rates. You guys know the Bank of Canada increased another uh, prime another quarter. So it's interest rates are still rising. We're in a rising interest rate environment. I want to talk in a little bit about what I think that means for the real estate market and why I think we're going into we're going to be going into a really good buying season because it's getting cold. And when it gets cold, the deals start coming out because no one else is coming out. When you're the only person hunting, it's much, much easier. So uh, I'm really excited for the buying season. The prime interest rate hikes are great. For the next 90 to 120 days, it should basically light a fire under investors' butts who've got locked in rates. They've locked in, they locked in yesterday. I know some of my investors have locked in interest rates. They've been applying for mortgages at more than one lender all at once. And that's why I always recommend applying to multiple lenders because you've got that distinct advantage. Um, <laughs> all right, sounds good. Thanks, Kyle. Um, that's a good little comment there. So she's not here right now. They're coming back from, from her in-laws there. So we'll have to be fast. Uh, okay, so we're talking about interest rate environment, talking about a whole bunch of stuff related to that. Um, hey, Watson. Hey, Sky Investments. Fraser, how you doing? Audio's good. Okay, cool. Um, what are your thoughts on variable or fixed rate mortgages right now? I'm looking at 3.69 for a five-year fix. That sounds fantastic. Um, the 3.69% five-year fix at the current... You guys are going to remember Prime's gone up now, right? So everyone's looking at like three point, like, I don't know. People are, some people are paying like almost 4% now with the new hikes. So not bad at all. Um, I know there was a time where you could get in the five-year variable range. You could still get in the, you know, mid to high twos. No problem. 2.5, 2 2.7, 2.9. Um, depends if you're doing a private mortgage insurance or whether you're doing an uninsured mortgage 20% down. So it does play into things a little bit. It also depends if you're going to play the angle of, Hey, I'm going to live here. And so your intent is to live in the property and then you go ahead and rent it later on. Or if you're going to say, Hey, it's just a rental property. So it depends on your angle. Rental properties obviously carry a premium. There's supposed to be a risk premium associated with that. So the interest rate is higher, right? Okay. Um, Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Welcome, Mr. No. Good to see you on. So throw in your questions down below. Well, these questions kind of, Oh, there's one more question from Jake. Before I jump into the live analysis, we are going to do, this other question. Also, could you please comment on collateral mortgages? Are they worth the cost involved in changing to a new lender at renewal time? Thanks, Mike. Um, it depends. So the whole discussion of, it depends. So cl collateral mortgage, ideally, you can't borrow as much typically on a collateral mortgage. So there's some downside. Um, I've not found the premiums to be, uh, on your interest rates to be any better. Um, that was what I've seen sort of. Um, the other thing too with changing lenders, you're going to have breakout fees. You're going to have like, so the interest differential breakout fee, you're going to have any um, government administrative breakout fees, registration fees, legal fees to, to move the mortgage over. Now, oftentimes lenders will to get your business, use in-house legal and they'll cover your legal fees, they'll cover your appraisal costs. But these are all costs that when you're switching financial institutions, you're going to have to incur these costs. I've always been able to negotiate when I switched between lenders, um, I was able to negotiate much better terms. And it's interesting because when I started investing in real estate, interest rates were where they are now, right? And then they dropped. If you, if you historically watch from like 2011, 2012, it's like 2014, we hit the bottom. And I was getting, my first house had a mortgage, I think at 3.69, 3.79. And I refinanced it back down at 2.72 or something like that. And that differential, even though I paid $1,500 to cancel out of my mortgage and change lenders, actually, no, this was the same lender. I refinanced with the same lender and the breakout fee was much smaller than the interest differential over a two year period. So I obviously refinanced the mortgage, broke out of my five year term and locked in again at a lower rate. So that's a beauty. People think they're locked in for five year term. It's not necessarily true. It's often just a three month different interest differential is the penalty they're gonna charge you. So something to think about, um, if you're gonna throw on a new mortgage on a property, you've gotta, you gotta factor in what are the costs to break out of that mortgage. And then you can think about the terms too, because terms are very important. If you value prompt payment, if you value being able to skip a payment, you value you know, certain terms within the mortgage, flexibility, um, the amortization period being you know, 10, 15, 20, 25 year, 30 year. There was even 35 and 40 year amortization periods previously. Now that's kind of, they've scaled that back and 30 year I think is the best you can do. Um, the longer you amortize, obviously, the less principal payments, the more, uh, the lower your payment in general, right? You have to divide that cost over a longer period of time. That's what you want as an investor. You don't want to pay down your mortgage. It actually reduces your ROI. The faster you pay it down, the worse it is. So you want to stretch it out over a long period of time. And that's been historically what you've wanted to do. So it depends, right? There's a lot of factors, Jake, to answer your question. It depends if you have a ton of equity built up on the property. 
And if you could access, say, 100 grand in equity on that property, it might make sense to put on, you know, to put on another mortgage, or a second mortgage on it, or to refinance and put on a new, new product, mortgage product. So that's something you got to think about. What can you do with that capital? If you're borrowing at three, four percent plus some breakout fees or whatever to put the new mortgage on, can you take that money and, and make more than that three or four thousand dollars? If the answer is yes, which it was for me, I was able to borrow money and then re-leverage it and buy more properties where I was getting double and triple digit returns. It made a lot of sense for me to refinance my properties. It might not for you. So it's very situational. Um, sorry, my brain is super foggy today. Like I said, I felt like four hours sleep and I've been on my phone. I had 100% battery at 7 a.m. this morning. I was burnt to zero by about 11.30. And then I charged it again, a full charge, 100%. And my iPhone battery was burned again. Now I'm almost dead again. I had to charge it, it was at 1%. So I go through two batteries in a day. That's how long I'm on the phone. That's how many texts I'm sending in a day. Because I've got guys, junk removal guys coming in. I've got window guys there. I've got uh, you know, foundation work. I've got you know, contractors calling me, material issues, tenants, all of these things all day long, people just calling and trying to solve problems. And that's what I do all day long. And that's how I create value. That's real value creation. And that's real estate. So if you think real estate is this passive thing, where you do absolutely nothing. It's just not true, especially in the build phase. So when you buy a property, I like to buy for arbitrage. So my properties need work. They need value to be added to them. And in that process of getting everything set up, there's quite a bit of energy. And if you're doing that with 10 properties or 15 properties you just acquired, you have 15 times the energy. Like just even setting up utilities, calling, getting insurance set up, um, putting tenants in the units, making sure the tenants are happy. When they first move in, they'll have a list of things that aren't they don't like. And you'll go through that list and say, this is something we're going to actually fix. This is something we're going to fix down the road. Work with the tenant, keep them happy. All of these things have to be done when you acquire a new property. There's a lot of work associated with that. So a um, ton of work, and then it becomes a semi-passive investment, and that is real estate. Uh, eventually, it gets to a point when the tenants are placed, everything's kind of uh, copacetic, everyone's happy. Then you get to a point where it's kind of passive. And then something will come up, nothing will happen for three weeks, and then something will come up. And oftentimes what will happen is days like today, 10 things will come up at one property, and then I'll have nothing for another week. Um, so it just depends on what phase in the journey you're on. So anyway, let's get into this before my computer dies. Let's do some analysis. Um, see some questions here. We're going to get to these in a sec. Mr. No, we're going to pause right at your question, and then I'm going to try to get these other questions here from Noel and Akira and Watts and Rick and Tommy. And Jake, no problem. Happy to answer your question. You guys ready? Want to go into the MLS and just pick a random deal and talk about it? Hopefully. Hey, Michael Chong, how you doing? Welcome on, guys. If you're just joining on the stream, we just spent the first few minutes talking about what I've been up to, just sharing some of the experience for, with everyone, and then we do some live Q&A. So um, if you have any issues with the audio or video sync, let me know because I want to improve and make things better for you guys. Okay, so where do you guys want to grab a property from? And do I have the analysis sheet open? Nice, I do. Okay, so I still have open from last week, or I open up the one from last week. Perfect. So you guys ready? We're gonna go pick a property. I'm gonna start pick one in White Hills area because that's where I live. Just happened to be in that area in London. It's the northwest quadrant of London, and then we're gonna pick one from East London because why not? Okay, let's analyze. Oh, this is the problem with trying to use a uh, trackpad. Let's pick something here. What do we got? Okay. I'm down here in Limber Lost. Got some more condos there. We did one last week that was a condo. Let's try to pick something different this week. Bunch of single family homes that suck. This trackpad's garbage. I'm gonna plug in my mouse. Can't deal with it, guys. Can't deal with the trackpad. Okay, zooming in. If anyone has any preference in area, let me know. Any deals they want me to look at specifically, that'd be cool too. Uh, I'm down for that. Most of the single family houses in North and West don't cash flow. There are a ton of properties in this area that are $750,000, $800,000, and they rent for $2,000 a month. The numbers make no sense. The mortgage is more than $2,000 a month. These guys are happy just to park money and have no cash flow. A lot of Toronto buyers buying in here. A lot of people buy a property, they move out, they upsize, they keep the old property thinking, I want to have a rental property. It's new build, it's turnkey, I don't have to worry about anything. It's just nice and clean. Old houses have problems. They have maintenance. I don't want to deal with that. I want a super clean property. And that's, that's their mindset, right? And because of that, they don't make a lot of profit, almost none. And so I wouldn't buy these properties to cash flow. You might buy these properties to flip, but it's a risky strategy because as we're going into a higher interest rate environment, you could see depreciation on the properties. So that could be something that um, you want to consider. Can you believe this, guys? Just saw this listing right here. I'm just bringing it up. 1653 Richmond. I watched these condos go up. It's like a medical commercial lower and then residential condos above. 
just ridiculous. I'm gonna open this up just so someone can take a look. Cause this is gross. Six hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a two bedroom condo near Masonville. Mason Masonville Mall area. They're not even that nice. The building's kind of ugly, I think. It's a little bit modern, but it's sort of an ugly building. The finishes don't even look that nice. Um, I mean they're nice, but they're not six hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a two bedroom nice. They're like these are way overpriced. There's not even a good view. This makes no sense. I don't know who's buying these. Um, they cannot cash flow. They'd rent for like this pad would rent for like fifteen to nineteen hundred dollars a month. Maybe on Airbnb you get three thousand. Um, I, I have OSB set up. We haven't got the second screen is the problem. I will work on screen sharing in the future, guys, for you. Um, but unfortunately, right now, the issue is. Let's see if this gets any better. Can we zoom in on it? If I focus my face here, will it? No. I'm sorry, guys. I don't have it set up. I'll try next week to get the OS the OSB screen sharing. Alan, how you doing? Unfortunately, I don't have that. So if you guys could kind of see, like the pictures are just, like they're nice. The place is nice, but it's not. What if I put my hand here and cause the camera to focus right here? Come on, autofocus. Find my screen. Nope, it's not gonna happen. It's gonna focus on my face instead. Anyway, so this is not a property we're gonna analyze because there's not even a point. It wouldn't even cash flow. The ROI would be like zilch. This is an example of a deal you would never wanna buy. I, without even running the numbers on this, I know that the ROI is bad. Um, the rents are like, quarter percent rule. This is like a Toronto deal. It's like buying a condo in Toronto, but not Toronto rents, not Toronto. It isn't Toronto. So it's overpriced. People from Toronto will come and buy these properties. And I don't know why they just do. Um, okay. So that's, that's that. Um, let's try and pick something that can cash flow. Maybe go down Richmond. We go towards downtown. Maybe we go over here by Western. Maybe there's something. That's four hundred five hundred thousand dollar house, four hundred fifty five thousand dollar house, four hundred seventy thousand dollar house. Here's a property on Castle Grove. It's three hundred ninety nine thousand. And of course, there's no pictures. Great. Um, licensed five bedroom at the City of London, close to Western University, the University Hospital, Masonville Mall, Costco, shopping, and great walking trails. Perfect for a single family or your investment needs in a desirable neighborhood, North London. Furnace and AC was done in 2016. Windows were all done in 2011. Hot water tank is owned, not rented. This four level back split has current tenants until May 31st, 2019. You rented for $17.50 a month plus utilities. Super low rent for the area. I know these back splits, they can be converted to six and seven bedrooms. Not that you get that legally, but there are ways to convert these into massive bedrooms. So you could have five massive bedrooms on these Castle Grove houses that are back splits. So the basement has a nice big window in them too, in the lower units. So. Um, this property we can we could try and analyze and see if it works. I think it's overpriced in my opinion, just based on comps and stuff that I've seen in the area. It has a nice little garage, looks like in the back. They've built onto that where normally is a lean to. So we'll do a quick analysis. And I don't think it'll be a buy, but we'll try. So let's say you bought it for three hundred and ninety thousand um, dollars, which is a ten thousand dollar discount. I like to just try for a little bit of a discount. You know what? Let's assume it's a hot market, you're not gonna get a discount. Three hundred and ninety nine thousand. Okay, so you're seventy you're seventy-nine thousand eight hundred down payment before including closing costs. So a little over eighty thousand dollars to effectively buy this property. So where's the insurance gonna be on a property like this? Probably it's a student rental too. It depends how you run it. So if you ran it as a student rental, it'd be like probably like seventeen sixteen, seventeen hundred a month of insurance. You get a decent insurance provider. Your utilities on a house like that, I'm gonna assume, are around a uh, hundred for gas, a couple hundred for hydro and water, probably about almost 400 bucks a month. So you're 4,500 a year in the 5,000 range. Your rental license fee is 50 bucks a year. The first time you apply, it's going to be like 300. So there's going to be a little bit of additional costs there for that. Um, Cause it's not a condo. We talked in the last segment about condos and townhouses and freehold condos and vacant land condos. They are exempt from the rental license program. It's like Windsor, Ontario. There are lots of rental properties. I used to own one for 200 grand. It was a duplex. Um, it was a townhouse. It didn't have a condo fee at all. We just, the five of us split on the cost of maintaining the snow and the grass. It was $15 a month we paid. Um, we agreed to, to kind of do that. And that was something we did. It was a duplex that had so many bedrooms. The city would never license it. It would never have passed. And great property that the city could never bug me on because it's exempt from the rental license program. It's like Windsor. And I was buying that like 200 grand. It was rented for 25, 2600 a month. The numbers really did work on this property and you don't have to worry about the city. So you can still buy in London and avoid the rental license. Um, okay, so this property, like I said, if you guys are joining in, it's 418 Castle Grove Boulevard. We're just doing a quick uh, 
quick ana analysis on 418 Castle, Gar Castle Grove Boulevard. And it's kind of like a nice, um, you know, back split. So the back of it is raised up. So you got a basement that has a nice uh, sort of window area. Nice brick property. You can see at the back it's sided on the upper raised ranch portion. They've put in a garage on the side. Typically in this area, there's lean-tos on the side. So it's nice that they've upgraded to a garage. You could theoretically rent that garage separately for about 100 bucks a month, but you're going to have to deal with the parking situation. And it's, I mean, it's like a car and a half wide driveway, it looks like. There's no interior pictures, which is a bad sign. Probably because the unit is rented, the tenants wouldn't let them in, or the tenants don't keep a clean place. So they've left pictures out for a couple of reasons. Sometimes there's a gold mine. I'll go into properties and it's mint inside. And I'm like, why are there no pictures up here? Why did the agent... Why was the agent so lazy they took pictures of the front of the house and that's it? Why didn't they do a little bit more effort and hire a photographer or even just go and take better pictures themselves? So there could be an opportunity here. Most likely it's because the tenants have you know, dirty habits and it's not going to be photogenic. So five bed, two bath. It has the potential to be more. Um, it could be a six or seven bedroom, I assume, based on other properties in the area. But let's assume it's a five bed. Let's assume there's no way to increase it. We know it's rented till May 31st. Ew, May 31st. So ideally, you'd want it also rented to April 30th so you can sync up with the student calendars. This is probably not even rented to students. It's probably rented to a family for $17.50 a month plus utilities. It's not going to be great rents. Let's run it with the real numbers and run it at market rents because it's not at market rent right now. It's below market rent. Okay, so we've got property taxes. In this area, you're going to be like 4000 give or take. We'd go look up what the property taxes would be, maybe 4200 if I had to guess for this this size property based on the current valuation at London's Ontario's current mill rate, which is the rate at which property tax is charged. And MPAC, Municipal Property Assessment Corporation, determines the value for the property. MPAC is almost always lower than the current value of the property. So that gives you guys a bit of a, an understanding of how I'm coming up with that expense. I mean, this expense is auto calculated. In this case, we're gonna remove the condo differential because it is just a house. So I'm gonna assume this is, this 2000 a year for maintenance, is on a well-maintained property. The brick looked to be in good shape. The windows were newer, the furnace was done. I'm assuming this property is in fairly good shape inside. It doesn't need a whole lot of maintenance inside and um, stuff. So that's why we're throwing in 2000 for maintenance, which includes OPEX and all that kind of stuff. I also always make my tenants handle the salt and the snow with a separate contract, as well as the grass with a separate contract. So I don't typically have expense for those things. Sometimes the student properties that you have to maintain that because the students won't agree to set agreement, but it depends on the property, it depends on the tenant. Now we've got an auto calculated mortgage. Interest rates are higher than they've ever been. So let's go like 3.75, let's say, for the mortgage. So you're looking at basically mortgage principal and interest. Your mortgage payment is $16.95 a month, roughly. Now this could be a little bit give or take. This was this calculation that I was using was not a proper mortgage calculator. It was an if-then statement that I created. Basically, when interest rates were lower, as interest rates have been rising, higher percentage is interest and lower is principal. So this formula is going to be a little bit off. I should update that in the, in the template, but uh, you know, it's not a not a huge thing. So anyway, next we've got management. I mean, let's assume for this property to work, let's put management at zero, just to just try to see if it can cash flow because it's losing eight hundred and nine dollars a month right now, guys. Okay, so we are at. Total cost of $32,694, and we've got basically no cash flow. We're losing $534 a month on this property in cash flow, and the ROI is not great, 2.46% with mortgage pay down. So with mortgage pay down, you're getting $163 a month benefit. So anyone buying this property and just renting at $1,750, what are you doing? These people often bought these properties at 200 grand and they're not considering the impact and the value of market value. So it's one of those things where it really, you know, I don't know why someone will buy this property for 400 grand unless there's an opportunity to increase. Oh, wait, so that's why the rents haven't been updated. Sorry, my bad guys. Um, we'll do a low and a high. So 1750 plus utilities. I didn't do the rent chart. That explains a lot. It was at the last condo property. So if I adjust, to basically current rents of $17.50 a month. We drop utilities to zero, because the tenants are paying utilities. Then you've got effectively negative $599.50 a month. $599.50, so 600 bucks a month, every single month, cash flow negative. That's a real property in London, Ontario that some sucker is gonna buy. That's unfortunate, it really is sad. 
with mortgage pay down, we're looking at like 90 bucks, um, 90 bucks a month with mortgage pay down. So your cash flow negative every month, but you're making 90 bucks in the mortgage pay down. Um, yeah. So anyway, hope that, um, let's see. Okay. I'm catching up with some masters here. Uncle G style, man. Quality was a lot better last Wednesday. Okay. Maybe the lens is on a bad setting right now. I don't know. It does look like it's got lower. We have the wrong lens on it. I don't think so. We could be on a different picture setting with our, our camera as well. The settings can make a huge difference. I apologize if we're on the wrong setting. If it's not, you know, focusing nicely on, on my face. Yeah, the autofocus seems to be kind of buggy. We'll try to improve the quality. Yeah, someone, so future Wiz, to answer your question, why would someone buy this property? They might also see potential. So they might think to themselves, there, the quality got a little bit better there. Did you do anything? I think OBS just jumped up a notch. Probably just on a bad setting. Um, okay, so what, what if I get this a little bit closer so you guys can see? If I were to put this like right close. Let me try something, guys. Hang on. Bear with me, people. Let's see if we can get people to see the actual. If we lowered the camera down, can you lower the camera down a little bit? Just drop it on the stand. If we just, maybe they'll get a view of the screen. Maybe they'll. Drop this down because I, I got about half the screen in it. Maybe it'll it'll focus down on me. If I drop the brightness, maybe that would help too. Drop it right down to about there. Let's see if that helps. Yeah, maybe that'll help. Not they can still see my face too. You know, I'll go on this side and then that way it can, it can be centered in the camera. people can you still see me well it, it, I don't know if it will focus on the screen or not it's, uh, it's gonna prioritize my face over the screen but get my face nice and clear no I don't know we'll have to do a screen share I'm sorry I tried it was an idea we got to experiment that's what business is all about right successful business is about experimentation of course this is wrapped around the chair so Well, we tried. Oh, wait, wait. If I bring it back, you guys can see that, can't you? Oh, hang on. Do, do, do. Is that better? Maybe it was just too bright. Hang on, let's try that. Yeah, I wish I had screen share for you guys. But what you can see effectively right here, this is nice because I can actually hold the mouse right here. Let's go, let's bring the camera up a little bit so my face is in, in scope. And then this could actually work pretty good. They could probably actually see this. Is it darker better? Is it better there? Anyway, so you guys can kind of see where I'm working with here. See where I'm, yeah. You can go up even a tad higher and you'd be all right, I think. This camera's still in focus. There. Is that better? Is the, is the setting better, the quality better than it was? Is it live streaming okay? We're directly from the lens, right? So. Should be, should be better quality than the phone at least. Anyway, we're, we're locked in. Anyway, hopefully that's a bit better. People can see the screen better now. Kind of, I'm still in focus, but the screen's more of a priority. Okay, so we're talking about this property, trying to analyze this, this property on Castle Grove, and we're looking at negative, I mean, you're making, what do we say, net benefit before tax, 100 bucks a month, $98 a month. So this property, the only buy would be that you could somehow sell it for more in the future. That should not be, your motivation in buying property in London, Ontario. Because guess what? If I buy the property for 300 grand, the cash flows, I guarantee it's gonna appreciate better than this property. So why would you buy a bad appreciating property and one that doesn't cash flow? It just seems bad all around. Your exit strategy is gonna be an investor. And wouldn't an investor prefer more cash flow and a better cap rate? I mean, I know I would. So I don't know how these properties sell. I don't understand, the fundamentals make no sense unless uh, now I'm going to do some analysis. Okay, so we start at 1750 plus plus utilities. Now imagine if you could do inclusive of utilities. And you could get, in that area, almost 600, let's call it 600 a bedroom. If you made them nice enough, the max rents you probably have around 600 bucks a bedroom. So $3,000 a month in rents. Now if we grab that as our 
as our rent there. Boom, boom, boom. We're adjusted over here. The annual rent's there. Now, if you get three thousand a month in rent instead of seventeen fifty plus utilities, you could evict the tenants there and put in better tenants. And you'd have an opportunity to get effectively. What are we saying here? Two hundred and seventy-five dollars a month positive cash flow. Now, if you had pretty economical students that were decent on utilities, or even just a family who's willing to pay three thousand all inclusive, I mean, you have a hard time finding a family that's going to pay three thousand for that place. They can go rent a brand new eight hundred thousand dollar house in London, Ontario. For three thousand dollars a month so i don't know students will pay it though and so will young professionals who are just kind of sharing it right um like kind of buddies who are sharing by the bedroom they want to be in that area they want to be close to ivy western whatever there, there's reasons right location premiums three thousand dollars a month you got net net cash flow positive three hundred and seventy five dollars and fifty cents a month now this property at three thousand a month is actually doable in this, in this area for a five bedroom totally possible it's licensed for that it's, that's the ideal purpose for said property so you've got your $275 a month positive cash flow. With mortgage pay down, you're looking at about $973 a month. Now your rate of return is about 14.64%. So you are making almost $1,000 a month. So the numbers could actually work if you're to evict the tenants and put in premium rents, 600 bucks a bedroom. 600 bucks a bedroom is totally doable. You could do an Airbnb play, maybe get a little bit more rent. But I would like to acquire a property like this at around 300000 that's where the numbers will make sense, right? If I adjust the purchase price, I think this will become a buy. At 400, it makes no sense, but if we adjust it 100,000 off, all of a sudden now it's a buy, right? Just barely. At 299,000, this property's cash flowing 750 bucks a month, and it's 1,270 bucks a month in with mortgage pay down in, right? You're positive each and every month. So at, at 300,000, it totally works, and the ROI goes to 25.39%. But a current asking price of 399, looking at 14.64% for an older property in this area, I think it's overpriced. You'd have to find a way to get more rent in some way. I'm not comfortable getting more than 600 a bedroom um, for this said property. I just I think that's too much. More than 600 a bedroom in this area, you can do it. I mean, I've seen people get 650 for a nice big bedroom, depending how it's laid out. I have to see the property, I have to walk through it, of course, to verify whether the expense items I've decided on are proper. This is a first screen, right? So I do a first pass. And I'll do this on like, I will sit down and do this on 50 properties in a night. And I can do that and probably, I do this really quick when it's by myself. I will, I will buff through this Excel and, and do this 50 properties in maybe two hours. And then I'll send, I'll basically send my realtor all the properties I want to see. All the ones that pass that have minimum 25% cash on cash return. So then there's, a, there's an opportunity there to go through them and say, okay, did the rents I forecasted actually make sense? Did, do the expenses, does 4,500 a year for utilities make sense? I'm going to look in the attic. I'm going to shine my flashlight around and say, okay, there's no insulation in the attic. I better budget for a little bit more in utilities or, you know, little things like that where I'll make slight adjustments, et cetera. So to have to evict these tenants, they're paying 1750 plus utilities. By the way, they're not going to want to go um, unless they're students and maybe they're finishing their, their schooling. A lot of landlords in London, Ontario, they're under renting their properties because they don't understand the internet. I see signs out still, people rent for rent with a phone number. It's like they don't have a Kijiji ad. Those type of people aren't getting the max rents. They aren't doing proper advertising and marketing. So that's the kind of properties that I would target. However, I think this property is slightly overpriced. At 299, it's a buy. At 399, it is not a buy. It's a pass. It's a hard pass. Even at market rents, even if you go through the stress of getting rid of the current tenants, there just isn't a play there. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to go up and, and hit some of these questions here before we do the next property. I saw someone wanted 2003 Royal Crescent, very East London. Sutherland, happy to do that. We'll bring that property up. We'll do it. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can catch up on these questions here. Paying off credit card debits versus adding to investment stocks. Thanks for your input, Mike. So, Akira, um, almost always, I'm going to preface this with it depends because it depends on what you borrowed. If you borrowed at a, on a 0% MBNA credit card and for a year you're fixed in at 3%, interest, it makes no sense to pay on your credit cards. I have the 0% MBNA card and I was borrowing for down payments on properties at 0%, like $10,000, $15,000, right? On these, these awesome cards. And my BMO cards were sending me, I have a $30,000 limit, let's say, they were sending me promotions to borrow at 3%, a 0% but 3% balance transfer uh, fee that you have to pay one time. But for that whole year, I get to borrow at 3% cost. That's amazing. You take advantage of that money, you use that, you invest that. Now, if you've got debt and you're paying traditional credit card interest rates, we're talking 17.99, 18.99, 22.99% interest rate. 
please, please, please pay all of that debt off ASAP. Sell every investment you have and pay down that credit card debt. Take your savings, pay down that credit card debt. Take your emergency fund, pay down that credit card debt. You get an instant after tax return of 22%. You will not get those kinds of returns in any other vehicle except for real estate if you're lucky. Um, as lucky, I mean, if you're smart and how you buy. Now, I get better than 22%, but I still, a risk-free premium, right? If you pay off that debt, it's guaranteed. Where do you get a guaranteed 22%? There are no guarantees in real estate. There are no guarantees in, in any investment, in any equity. Any investment that's guaranteed 22% after tax, after tax, no. No, it's too risky. You don't even want to be involved in those types of investments typically in any public equities or bonds just because they're junk bonds, right? You're getting like junk bond returns for risk-free premiums. Pay down your credit card debt. I can't say this enough. Go and get a 0% MBNA credit card, borrow the 8%, they'll put it in your bank account, use that 8,000, right? At 0%. Take that $8,000 and pay off the bad debt. Go into your bank and get a line of credit and reconsolidate that debt at 6, 5%, 8%, 10%. Even 10% is better than 20%. Do not carry balances on your credit cards. General rule of thumb, do not do it. It is very bad financial advice. I know people who carry balances on their credit cards and they pay interest payments. They pay the minimum payment and their balances are growing at 18, 20% um, annualized, often compounded monthly. It is disgusting. Some credit cards even compound daily. So every day they're calculating the interest payment. So it's just, it's a 22% calculated daily, compounded daily is disgusting. Like that's, it's a criminal. Uh, almost the rates that they're charging. And I get why they do it. They're, they got to make the money and it's their business model. And guys like me always pay off the balance. I, I don't miss balance payments ever. And so I get a 2% cash back rewards by everything on credit, but I pay it off when, at the end of the month. And so they obviously are, are utilizing. You don't want to be those, one of those people that they're utilizing and taking advantage of. So find a cheap way to pay on that debt. That's all I got to say about that, Akira. I'm so glad you asked the question. And I hope that here in the comments about you making a shift to pay down the credit card debt as soon as possible. It's a risk for you're investing in yourself. You're getting a guaranteed 22% after tax rate of return, which is equivalent to like 35% or 40% pre tax. It's the same as, yeah, I, I can't even harp on this enough. Pay down your credit card debt. Do not carry high interest debt. It makes no sense. Okay. Hi, Mike. Just wanted to give you a quick hello. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Thanks, Kamal. Great to see you on. Watts, is there anything wrong with me opening up HELOCs on all of my properties at the same time, or should I spread it out? Will it hit my credit? How will it take an impact on my credit score? So if you apply for a whole bunch at once, a whole bunch of credit products all at one time, you have a much lower impact on your credit initially because um, the banks can't. So if you're applying for a whole bunch at once, right? You're getting a whole bunch of hits at once, but the other banks can't see that you're applying for HELOCs if you don't disclose it. And so they'll ask what your liabilities are and what your assets are. You don't have to disclose anything you're applying for. So if you do the again, you say, hey, I have a million dollars in equity in all my properties. The bank's like, wow, we'll easily put a HELOC on this said rental property. But if you were to say, I'm going to apply at the same bank for a whole bunch of HELOCs, they'll probably reject you. They'll say, this guy's accessing too much credit. So I would go to every different bank and get a HELOC on all my different properties all at once. And you'd probably get approved. And the bank would probably um, not know, none of the different banks would know that you were doing that. So you'd have a huge edge and getting a ton of access to capital. I have done strategies like this. It's a fantastic way to hack your credit and get a ton of available credit. Um, great idea. Go ahead and do that. Um, so nothing wrong with that. You're going to take a small hit on your, to access all this money and, and borrow it. It's going to hit your credit score a little bit, but that's part of the business. Like I would go from 850 to 700 credit score where I buy a few properties and then it would rebound, you know, in a few weeks, a few months, let's call it six months max. As I, you know, paid down the debt and showed that I had good behavior. Um, credit score. So don't let your credit score, you know, rule your life. You're out there to make profit, right? The credit score is just one way that you, they, you, the banks and the institutions use to justify how much you get, how much they'll lend to you, right? How likely you are to repay them. So you want to maintain decent credit, but at the same time, don't be so focused on keeping your credit score high that you miss out on opportunities to use cheap debt and take advantage of actually having a good credit score. Because the advantage of having a good credit score is you can get the best cards, the best interest rates, and the best access to capital. So that's the, the advantage. How would you negotiate a better deal to a bank? Because I would think a bank would only offer terms black and white, or they can only offer what they can offer. Rick Lumen, that's totally untrue. Um, so let's talk about what banks can actually offer. They can always do better than the posted rate. They can always do better than what the broker says they can do. 
I have always got better rates. Now, if you apply somewhere else and get a rate at say 2.7 on paper, you bring it into the bank who says the lowest we can go is 2.9, you're a preferred client, and you show them the approval from another lender, they will almost always match it to keep your business. You think they're gonna they're gonna lose a thousand dollars in interest to get your business? Of course they are. It costs them more than that already to get the appraisal on your property. They, if you don't, if you are getting an appraisal with the lender, right? You can have two appraisals from two different lenders. If you don't close that lender, the lender doesn't can't bill you for the appraisal. The lender has to eat the cost of that appraisal. If I get go get a more a free approval at TD and at BMO, one of them is going to have to eat that eat that appraisal cost. They're going to have to eat all that administrative cost. It costs them probably at least a thousand dollars just to to pay someone to put together the application, and underwriters to review it, an appraiser is probably four hundred dollars to be sent out. They can't bill me for that appraisal fee unless I close on the mortgage with them. That's how most residential mortgages work. So there there is quite a bit of flexibility in what they can offer you. And almost always they can do better than the posted rate. And I have almost never taken the posted rate unless it was such that I couldn't get approved anywhere else. So I couldn't show them anything else. And I was just happy to get an approval. So that circumstance is always different, but uh, great question, Rick. You should always be shopping around. Ratespy.com is my favorite. If they were paying me something, I'd plug them in the link, but they don't. Um, they're a fantastic website. They're way better than Rate Hub. And truly unbiasedly, go there and, and see what the best rates are. They'll even, they even spy on what people are getting for preferred clients at the banks. And it's always better than what is posted. Also, do not pay for appraisal fees. I never pay for appraisals ever. Even when I go with that mortgage, I make sure they comp me for the appraisal. On a refinance, I make sure they comp me on the legal fees and the appraisal. Negotiate. You have the business. The bank wants to acquire your business. Once they've started sinking costs into your application, they are more likely to, especially if you're a good client, you have good credit score, they, they think you're going to repay then your risk factor is pretty low. They can often go down a little bit on the interest rates because the interest rates are for an average person. If you're better than average at paying your bills, better than average net worth, better than average income, you have a bit of play. You have a bit of negotiation room. You're the, you're the one who has the business to offer them, right? So there's a bit of, don't be afraid to negotiate. I've always been good at negotiating at everything and it's been a detriment because I sometimes negotiate a little too hard. I push a little too hard sometimes on contractors, on pricing for things. And it can bite you in the butt too. And I'll do a segment on, why negotiating too hard can be a bad thing. I, it's paid off fairly well for me, but at the next stage of my game, sometimes negotiation, that's one of my skills as I'm good at negotiating and I'm good at getting prices. Um, so yeah. How do you track, so Tommy says, how do you track individual expenses and income on all your properties? Are they all in one banking account? No, Tommy. Bank of Montreal has up to 20 personal checking, individual checking accounts under one plan fee. They're the only bank that offers that. So I have 20 personal bank accounts and we have on the corporate side, we have a different individual bank account for each and every property. You must, must, must have an individual bank account for each and every property. It is necessary that you run all inflows and all outflows through said bank account. There's no other way to do it. It'd be way too confusing. We currently have 35 properties, my partner and I and in the company, 35 properties would be way too much to manage. Could you imagine if I had 10 transactions in a day? A bookkeeper would have no idea what went where. So we make sure that all the expenses are washed through an individual account. So I can print off a statement and say, hey, here are all the inflows, all the rents that came in, when they came in, here are all the outflows, here's what went where, when. If I pay my credit card, I try to transfer that balance to that account and run it through there. Um, even if I'm just washing the expense through there, at least it's in that checking account. I'm not perfect. Sometimes I make mistakes. Sometimes I buy things out of my personal checking account or I pay off my personal credit card that I spent 10,000 on buying materials and I have to allocate those materials to the specific properties. We keep a Google Sheets going and we used to run an Excel and just Google Sheets is way more efficient. Everyone can get access to it all at once. You can just forward a link to someone. My partner and I can easily get in and out on any device anytime. So I'm a big fan of Google Sheets. That's my input on managing and tracking expenses for your properties. Because at the end of the year, your accountant or yourself is going to have to do a mini, basically an income statement called the T776 form. You're going to fill that out, all your income, all your expenses for your properties. And it will become very, very complex if you don't keep good bookkeeping records. So that's important. I sometimes fall victim to you know forgetting to do that and months will go by. Not a good thing to do. I, I need to be better with that. Okay. Um, Next we have, thanks Mike, really appreciate your response. So wise, thank you, Jake, I appreciate that. Thanks for the positive comment. Uh, Michael Chung, how you doing? Okay, so 2003 Royal Crescent. Let's try and do the analysis on that property for those people who are still here. Um, yeah, Akira, great comment, just saw you, just saw you there. Um, pop in the comments, yes. Um, working on paying down credit card balances, but also directing towards investments. Yeah, I honestly, I know people, it could be a psychological thing and maybe it feels good to even save 50 bucks a month and put into investments. 
But if you have credit card debt, you should be prioritizing the hell out of that debt. Or at a minimum, you know, the, le the least thing you could do is go and consolidate that debt. Go talk to a debt consolidation specialist. Get an unsecured line of credit. If you have any equity in your property, go get a HELOC. Um, refinance your property. Pull that capital out at 3, 4, 5, 6, 7% interest and pay off the 22% debt. Or go get an MBNA 0% interest credit card and take their promotion for the first year where you basically get 0% um, interest on balance transfers and transfer the balance right out of your credit card. That'll basically wipe out, if you're paying 22% interest, it's very difficult to pay down the debt. The debt is doubling every three to four years at that rate of, of basically it's compounding against you. It's like what I talk about with the snowball where things start working in your advantage. It's the opposite effect, compound interest on credit card balances. It's working against you and the balance is growing. The more, as you're paying it down, you know, even $500 a month, sometimes a $10,000 balance, the interest payment is higher than the 500 a month. So you can never pay down the balance. It's the trap of just basically you're paying the interest growth on it and keeping it at just neutral. So anyway, that's my comment on that. Um, let's go up and see if we can get one quick analysis done here on 2003 Royal Crescent. Ba -ba -doo, ba -ba -doo. Let's go pull up one on 2003 Royal Crescent. I'm going to close this one off on Castle Grove. Where is there a place to put in the address? Save search, filters. There used to be a place you could just type it at the top. Like if I type in like 2003 Royal Crescent. I don't even know where that is. Royal Crescent. I'm looking at Royal Crescent now. Okay, so I found on the map. There's 1841 Royal Crescent. I don't see that there. Nope, that ain't it. 2003 Royal Crescent. Okay, found it. 95,500 purchase price. Tell me if Sutherland, if that's if that's right. Did I find the right one? So, okay. Let's go ahead and just for, before we go into it, I'd like to see where it is. So I think it was right here. So it's near Lord Nelson Public School in the Argyle area, right near the, the Veterans Memorial Parkway. So right near the highway there. Um, basically quick access to the highway, but it is in deep East London, kind of, uh, if I were to do a street view, it's not the best area, but I mean, what are you going to do? It's obviously a $95,000 house. So what's the story here? 2003 Royal Crescent, London, Ontario, 95,900 purchase price. This is dirt cheap. This is London, Ontario for you. You can buy properties under hundred grand. No problem. Estate sale. Of course it's an estate sale. So <laughs> In this case, someone, yeah, so three, this three bedroom bungalow is in need of repair. Property is being sold as is, where is, with no warranties, no representations, and no guarantees. Location of description is Clark Road, south from Dundas Street to Royal Crescent. It's a one story property. The age of the property is unknown. It's got a smallish lot, unfinished basement. Uh, it says it has a full unfinished basement, poured concrete foundation. Who knows if that's true? A rental water heater, probably from Reliance. Um, detached property, 937 square feet, and municipal water system, municipal sewer system, brick exterior. Let's go take a look at it on the Google Maps. 2003 Royal Crescent. London. I'm going to drop some knowledge bombs for you guys. So people are watching here. We're going to show you some really cool stuff with some of the searches that I do and what I like to look at. So this property... You guys can see where the area is. We'll go on the street here. You can see where there's some semis next door in the, I don't know if you can see this as I'm scrolling. We've got school there, it looks like. There's a walk sign. I think it's probably a school. I don't know the area super, super well. Houses don't look terrible here, actually. Um, what was it? It was 2003. 1991. Where's 2003? Is this 2003? Looks a lot like the house. Can't quite see from this angle. Do, 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 do. Yep, there it is. Okay, so this image from Google Images says it was captured in August 2017. So we can kind of get a feel for the date. The shrubs are overgrown. It's a corner lot, which is kind of nice. It's got a nice little walkway to the house there. The trees are growing near the house. So you don't get a great curb appeal, bad curb appeal. Um, has parking. Looks like it's got some garbage out here. The window well's got some crap in it. There's a, a couple of nice sheds here. The lot looks small, but 
it's a nice corner lot. This is a great price for this house at first impression. Um, I don't know how this couldn't cash flow. The windows look dated. These windows look like they're, they're wood down here. The roof didn't look terrible, but didn't look new. Um, some of the shingles, I saw a little bit of wear damage in that one image. I'll try and go back to it here and see what I can see. Can't really see. You can see there's some damage. You guys see to the exterior. You can't really see this here. There's some damage. Looks like to the eaves board, so it needs to be capped. Probably new eaves board. Um, looks like there's a hole right there. I could be just seeing it from a weird angle, but uh, it doesn't look like it's in great shape. The eaves board look really rotted. So what that means is like squirrels and mice and stuff can get in there. That looks like new eaves board. You can see here, yeah, it looks really rotted right in here. Um, but you can see it's all falling down. It looks like it's all falling down. It might be the image, it might be the picture. You have to go to the property and see. It's a very cute, small little property, but it needs some some exterior work. Let's call it five or ten thousand dollars to guarantee that you're gonna have everything nice and capped, eaves troughs put back on, nice roof. I'm being a bit conservative here. This will be a bit of a renovation project, and I I suspect this will go multiple offers. It's one of those estate sales they price extremely competitively to get people in under a hundred thousand um, dollars. Fantastic. How do you go wrong on a property like this? Other than location, right? So you got what, $95,000, 900. I bet you it'll go way over that. I don't think it'll list for that price or it'll sell for that price. I think it'll be a multiple offer situation. I'm gonna go back to here make sure the comments are good. Um, okay, so Rick, great question. Um, I'm gonna answer that in just a sec here. Uh, let me just get this property kind of figured out here. So I don't know what the, it doesn't give a lot of information. There's no pictures in the property that I can see in the listing. Um, so they just had a picture of the front of it. You can see it's in kind of rough shape, but it has a ton of obviously potential at 95,900. This is going to be a solid buy at the, at that price. It's going to be ridiculous. Um, let's do the analysis on it. Let's find out. 95,900 your, your market rents are probably, mm, Link them over here down. You're probably looking at a house like that. If you spent a little bit of money, it's probably disgusting inside. There's probably mold, probably a bad kitchen, probably um, a lot of different bad things going on in the property. So let's say we'll have to do some renovation to it. And at the end of the day, you can get 15, 50 a month plus um, at least hydro and probably gas. So your utilities would be a little bit lower. You probably have the tenant paid most of the utilities. You might have $75 a month with Reliance water tank and some small stuff. Um, Maintenance, so you're going to have to fix this property up. We're going to put in renovations. Let's call it $40,000. I don't know. I haven't seen the property, but I assume when it says as is, where is, that usually means structural damage. That usually means there's some significant water leaks coming in from the roof or major problems in the property. So you're going to put, oh, let's go 50000 just to be safe because I don't know. I haven't seen the property. I have to go in and we have to do an estimate and find out what it's going to be to re rehab this property. It might be 20000 I might be able to get it done a lot cheaper than what the market's valuing it at. And there might be a total total win here. You never know. So at ninety five thousand dollars, you're looking at nineteen thousand um, in down payment plus some closing costs. Call it twenty five grand all in plus a fifty thousand dollar reno. So you get seventy five thousand in capital injected into the project. There may be some some solid opportunity here. Oops. Got it linked to the wrong cell. There we go. So you're looking at on a property like this on twenty thousand dollars down. Quick numbers. Property taxes would not be near that high. They're probably two thousand a year on a property in that range. Maybe not maybe even 1900 your maintenance expense would probably be a bit higher on a property because the value of this property is so low. You have to adjust the maintenance up um, a thousand a year be like the minimum. I would say once you got it really fixed up. So I'm assuming in the $50,000 we're renovating it. We're making everything super turnkey. So there'll be no renovation needed or no, not a lot of maintenance needed ongoing, right? Um, you got a mortgage at 3.75. You're looking at, you know, mortgage payment of like $400 a month, give or take. Now, if you refinance that property, you'd have to obviously uh, have a higher mortgage payment, but you get all your capital. This could be a good burr, probably a huge potential for a burr here on this property. I'm going to say this is probably a solid buy. The net, if you have a look, the net benefit is $859 a month, and the monthly net cash flow is $60, $691 a month on this said property once it's renovated. Now, what we should do, because it's a renovated property, is adjust the cost base up to the refinanced price, they are, or at least the cost base, the 50,000 to put up into it. Oops, screwed that up. Okay, so at the new price, let's say you refinanced it a bit at 145,900, let's say you got it for 95,900, which I doubt you would, but let's just say you did, then it's is a screaming deal. And after you renovate it and pull your capital out, you'll have 80% loan to value on this. And you'll basically have 
$437 a month in cash flow, $692 a month in with mortgage pay down in, which is fantastic on the amount of capital with $29,000 you've got for a down payment on a property of this size. Fantastic. Your ROI is 28%, 29%. So that's a, a great buy. Your payback you get just from rental income alone, you get your, your, your uh, down payment back in three and a half years. So this property definitely meets the metrics. I would definitely go take a look at this property, put an offer on the property, probably even what, over asking, for sure over asking. They're going to be expecting multiple offers unless the property is really, really bad inside. I haven't seen it, so I don't know for sure. This would be a property I'd go see, for sure. I'd go take a look, drive by it. And uh, yeah, why wouldn't you go ahead and do that? This has got some solid, solid opportunity here. At first blush, there's a great ROI. I think you could probably sell this property. I have in my calculator, you can see the, my guesstimator based on rough estimate is about a $200,000 sale price. I probably adjust the cap rate a little bit only because this area has a little bit of a, like you can get a location premium if you're downtown or you're near Western or some location premiums right near Fanshawe. But if you're actually in this area, a bit of a location discount associated with this area. So you might take 200,000 as the base investor price that they would pay at a set cap rate and then adjust it down. So I might say it's 180,000. 170,000 fixed up really nice. So there is definitely 80, 90,000 dollars in play here. And if you can renovate it for 40,000, that'd be 50,000 dollars in upside. Totally a deal you'd want to take advantage of and get a great return on investment. With the forced depreciation play, you're looking at around 157% ROI. So there's definitely a way to pull all your money out and be cash out of this property and just cash flowing. So definitely, definitely some opportunity here. Um, you know what, Rick? Like foundation problems are not actually an issue. Um, I've never come across a property that I couldn't fix. Like as a worst case scenario, I just dig down. I got, I got a couple of Indian, like I, I have a crew of Indian students at Fanshawe that will dig for like, yes, um, the Excel document you have, if you go and check out how to, how to analyze a rental property, I'll put it in the description of this video. But if you look at how to analyze a rental property, I link on my website to a version of this tool. Um, it might be a bit outdated. I might have to update it a bit, but you'll have a version of this tool. I think it's, very close to this, almost identical. Right there, you can download for Microsoft Excel. So I do provide that for free, guys. Go ahead and download that tool. Feel free. Um, you could you could probably buy this property, renovate it yourself, and live in it. Get a sweet deal on a mortgage. This is another wrinkle we're going to talk about is if this property is is truly as is as bad as I think it might be inside, and there's leaks and the roof is the ceiling drywall has come down, the insulation is just hanging there. The bank will rule that it is in like not habitable. What that means is they will not put a residential mortgage on the property. So you have to go to private lenders or closing cash. Now I'm in a position I can close this in cash. It'd be no problem. What that does is eliminate a ton of the buyer pool. because Most people don't have a hundred thousand plus say $40,000 to renovate a property sitting around. They don't have 140 grand sitting around. If you do, you can take advantage of these set opportunities. I take advantage of opportunities like this. And then within 60 days, refinance all of my capital out. Great way to do it. When you buy this property, you want to register. You don't want to register the purchase price. The lawyers know how to, how to register properties so that they can't tell what you paid for it. That's important getting good appraisal. Um, always overestimate the cost on the appraisal so you get a higher refi than the actual, um, you know, what you've got put into the property. You want to pull some capital out. So there's definitely an opportunity here to make 40 or 50 grand, I think, on this property, or at least buy it and have some solid, solid cash flow. Um, yeah, the numbers, numbers seem great. Good buy in Sutherland. I think this is, could be a sweet deal. I'd be very, very surprised if. On an ROI with a bit of appreciation of like 44%, which is what we're seeing here, 150% um, ROI if you were to buy it, get be able to get a mortgage on it, if there was a way you could convince a bank to lend on it, and then renovate it and refinance all your capital out in a short period of time, you have still solid, solid cash flow. People discount a lot of people are renting these houses for like 700 a month plus utilities. I can get a, I can get people in there for 15, 1600 a month. So there's definitely opportunity here for this property. Now I haven't seen inside of it, so. I'm, Make, I'm taking some liberties with some of my assumptions because you have to make assumptions and move on, right? Some people will go through this and they'll say, you know, I'm just not sure about the property taxes. So I just, I, I freeze up. I don't know what to do. Or like maintenance. I don't know how, what the maintenance will be. So maybe you do a sensitivity analysis. I used to do this on all my properties. The second round guys, after I go see a property, I cost out the renovation and I move into sensitivity analysis. So I do a high, low, medium on rents. I do a high, low, medium on renovation. I do a high, low, medium on expenses. And so you can play with what is the worst case scenario if I got the worst rents, cost me the most to renovate, and the expenses were higher than I expected. In that perfect storm, can you cash flow? If interest rates rise one or two percent and you have to refinance, can you cash flow? 
if you can, then it's a good property to buy. If you can't, like the Castle Grove property, maybe not a great deal. This at like $180,000, probably not that great, um, especially given the amount of work it's gonna need. So it's all about price. Every deal can work, just about the, the factors and the price and some other things that kind of come into play to determine whether or not you wanna actually put an offer on this property. I would say you probably do wanna put an offer on this property. So there you go. That'll be the ones that we can analyze for today. I wanna do some questions here and then I wanna wrap up. I'm exhausted. And so I'm gonna to try to blitz through these. But next time, if you put the, in the description, the property, you can analyze it next time. So it gives you an idea. You can go download my template. Go ahead. I make nothing from you downloading it. Just take it, use it. It adds value to your life. Cool. That's what I'm here to do is add value to your guys' lives. So if I'm adding value to your life, now's a good time to smash that like button. It's a good time to share. And if you are not subscribed to my channel and you just found this, this live stream, please hit the little subscribe button there and hit that notification bell. I'd really appreciate it. The notification bell would be huge. The last few videos, have not got a ton of video views, three, 400 views, and we have a couple thousand subscribers. So guys are busy. I know, they, you know you guys and girls are busy and you don't have time to watch the videos, but it'd be cool if you did watch it. I put a lot of time into creating the content and I don't make anything from YouTube. So it's one of those things where I just like to give back and I'm hoping that I'm adding value to your guys' life. Okay, uh, we did this question here. We talked about T-Locks. Tommy, we talked about that question there. We did this analysis for Sutherland. You got in first, so we analyzed your property in East London first, and it's a total buy. Um, looks like a screaming buy at the price that it's at right now. Of course, in a multiple offer situation, you may end up overpaying. Be very careful of that. People will underestimate how much work is actually there in the property, and they'll sometimes overpay. You wanna make sure there's a healthy amount of margin between what you're paying for it, what you're spending to renovate it, and what you can sell it for. You wanna have a ton of margin, what I call a contingency budget, as well as a profit margin built into your property, because. Even though you're buying it to cash flow, you want to make sure you can still flip. Um, there needs to be those multiple exit strategies when you're buying a property. That's very smart. Protects your downside. And I'm all about being conservative and protecting your downside. And this is how you do it. Okay. Can you share a screen? I'm sorry. I wish I could. Alan, good to see you on. Watts, what's your opinion on purchasing pre-construction condos? Watts, um, in Toronto, it does a lot better than in London. Um, in a hot rising market, buying pre-construction, anything, condo, houses, you'll do fairly well because you don't put a lot of capital down, you lock up the price and you can wholesale the contract or, or basically assign the contract to someone for a fee. That can work really well so you don't have to close on the property. People have done historically very well in Toronto and places like that because they've been able to lock in pre-construction and the price after phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four has gone up. I've done it myself. I did a new build property, got in at phase one and sold it for a decent profit. However, the market did appreciate a ton. I should have held on to the property a little bit longer. However, we don't have a crystal ball and you know, no one knows what's going to happen in the future. If you did a pre-construction condo and it wasn't a cash flow type property and your only goal was to sell it for more than you bought it for, you better hope we don't go into a recession. You better hope that there's actually a, a solid exit strategy there for you. So that's something to kind of consider, something to think about. Um, yeah, I mean, that's sort of my, my high level thoughts on pre-construction. There is a play there, but you just have to be careful and insulate yourself against that. If you're going to live in the property, that's probably the best play because there's some utility value from that alone. If you have to hold the property for a little bit longer so you can get that return on investment, then that's not so bad, right? Okay, uh, next question. Rick Lumen says address. Hope I answered that question. I did give the address of Castle Grove there and the other property. Thomas says do a 30-unit apartment. Uh, there aren't many 30-unit apartments in London for sale. There's like two right now in the market. So uh, we can do an apartment. Next, next video, we could do something commercial. If there's a desire for that, I'd like to do a video specifically on that on the channel doing a commercial analysis, that'd be fantastic. Uh, okay, let's see here. Thomas says, Uncle G style, man. I don't know what Uncle G style is. I, I don't, is this the way he does his videos? That'd be cool. We should do more of this. Uh, it's get, giving value, I think, to your lives. Quality was a lot better last Wednesday. I'm sorry. Um, hopefully it's better. Maybe we have it on a weird setting. Don't know what it was that caused the quality to be a little bit worse this time. Could just be on a different, different setting. Could be an internet thing. I don't know. Why would someone do that? Appreciation. So future whiz, you're talking about that property on Castle Road. Why would someone buy that property? Oftentimes a real estate agent will convince the client to buy the property and tell them that there's going to be a ton of upside appreciation and cite examples from a bubble market like what we've had in the last two years. Past performance does not predict future performance. So do not buy something based solely on whether or not in the future the price may follow previous growth rates previous um, performance, right? So I, I don't recommend you follow that strategy, but a lot of investors are duped into doing that. 
in Toronto, there's this idea that you get a hundred dollars a bill of cash flow and you're happy. And it's been circulating in like by the guys, the key spire guys and all those guys that do that and girls that share on those courses. I'm not a huge fan of those courses because they prop promulgate, you know, bad, I think bad fundamentals. It's like buying overpriced stocks. You're buying overpriced properties that don't cash flow. I can buy within a one kilometer of this property in the same area, better cash flowing property. Why wouldn't I buy the better cash flowing property? So someone is buying this based on emotional reasons. They like the property. Their son or daughter likes the property. They've seen a few properties and they're happy. A lot of doctors, dentists, executives, their kids go to Western, they go to Ivy. They come down for a weekend and they're going to buy a property in that weekend because their time is a thousand dollars an hour. They might come down that weekend and say, we're buying a house. We're going to go see six houses. We're going to buy one. And so fundamental analysis doesn't matter. Cap rate doesn't matter. NOI, net operating income doesn't matter to them. So they, they would buy this property based on they like the way it feels. Their son or daughter is comfortable in the property. Hey, you know what? My son or daughter can live here and we can pay off, pay down the mortgage and we'll end up cash flow neutral. There's a lot of that going on in that specific area. And so a son or daughter going to Western University or Richard Ivy School of Business who's wealthy, their goal is their son or daughter being happy. And if they can sell it for a small profit four years after they've done their program, they're happy. Now, I'm not happy at that because that's a terrible use of capital. And I think you can do a lot better, but some people are okay with, you know, less. Um, the same same way that I'm not happy going into McDonald's and paying $15 for a meal. I'd rather use a coupon and get it for $3. Some people are happy going in and paying $15 for two burgers and fries and a drink. They don't know how to use coupons. They just don't care about that stuff. Same as in real estate. You got these rich people who are good at one thing. Like they're, I've met dentists and doctors who make half a million dollars a year and they don't want to be good at real estate. And they rely on the real estate agent to just buy them a property. And they don't want to spend time analyzing. They don't care. It's not about making a bunch of money. They already make half a million dollars a year doing something else. This is just a place to park their money, make their son or daughter happy. There are other factors that are emotional and people think price is the most important thing. They think cash flow and ROI is the most important thing. It is for an investor, but not most real estate isn't sold to investors, believe it or not. People are like they're amateurs, either amateur investors or they have other motivating factors behind their decision. And so you can't punish someone for that. I mean, it's their choice. They can totally go ahead and, and pay up what they want for a property. And if it makes them happy, that's cool. Real estate might not be their way that they make their money. They might just see it as a place to park money. So there are many reasons why future was, why someone might buy this property and why it's going to sell for way more than what I would pay for it. Okay. Patel thinks the quality is good. Nope. Not focusing on the screen. We tried, we've gotten a little bit better. I think this setup is, is better. The brightness is turned down. It helps screen share. would be great. Next time we'll try and get a screen share going. People say it's better. Analyze an apartment building deal. 10 million, spice it up. There aren't too many deals like that. And the challenge is in order to analyze a deal like that, I have to reach out. So most of the commercial real estate doesn't circulate on the MLS. Most of it's sold before it hits the MLS. You have to know someone who has an apartment building. Most commercial realtors will have 20 eyeballs look at the property before it even hits MLS. They even, the good commercial real estate agents don't even need to put their stuff on the MLS. They can just sell it to their network of people who are ready to buy based on a set cap rate. There's not as much marketing and emotional decision needed in apartment building investing. It is just about the numbers. It's not as much about the emotional decisions, the psychological stuff that goes along with residential real estate. So you're competing in a different market. It's a totally different game. And uh, you need to do more of this, more in-depth analysis than even this one. Um, because like, I, I have a better analysis that I do with commercial real estate. And I'll request a rent roll, for instance. The rents will not be available on a 27 unit. You have to get a package from the real estate agent. They'll send you a big package, they'll email it to you. It's a wholly different, totally different process with commercial real estate than residential real estate. Um, I, I like focusing on commercial real estate. I think that you're, the problem with commercial real estate on the like hotel side, like the bigger stuff, like the commercial, commercial stuff, not multifamily, is that you're competing against institutional money. Same with apartment buildings too. You are competing against institutional money. And institutions like REITs can go borrow money from Sun Life, $100 million at 2%. And Sun Life's happy just parking their money in something safe. And the stipulation on that investment is you cannot buy residential properties. You have to buy commercial. And a lot of big institutional money, that's a, that's a condition. So when I get big enough, I'll have to buy commercial property because they don't want their money parked in residential. I don't know why. It's just the, it just makes more sense. There's less risk and bigger buildings. They feel safer. So it's a different ballgame talking about commercial. And we can't really do it live. It's much more difficult to do it live. We could, I could get a rent roll package and we could do one, but it's better as a video than done done as live. So we'll put that in the queue. We could definitely do a video on that, but yeah, spice it up. Um, try to spice it up. Do you recommend buying your first property with no leverage 40 to 50 K house in the Midwest to get experience in cash flow? Future whiz. Yes. Um, experience is so, 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 so valuable. It's 
like even if you bought a property and you made no money, you'd come out way ahead. People pay ten, fifteen thousand dollars a year to go to school. You will learn a lot more buying your first property than you will in school. That's a guarantee, especially if you have an interest in real estate, especially if it's long term, you want to get into buying more properties. This will tell you if you buy a property, it needs a little bit of re rehabilitation, a bit of renovation. This will tell you if you have, if you're cut out for it. And if you aren't, then you can decide early on, right? There's nothing wrong with, yeah, just go ahead. It's better to time in the market as, as opposed to timing the market. You want time in the market. The sooner you buy, the sooner you start learning, the better off you will be. Uh, how do you get rid of existing tenants? Oh, Joe Lee, great question. We've talked about that. Check out the last two episodes. Um, Specifically in the last episode, I talked a ton about techniques to get rid of existing tenants. So there's a whole 20 minute spiel I go on about techniques to remove degenerate tenants. Uh, okay. Don, Don Trent, how you doing? Driving from Windsor to Toronto. What up? Hey Don, good to see you. Glad that you're on. Hopefully you're not burning through too much data, but at the same time I am appreciative of you joining in. Um, all in on V and MA tomorrow. I'm not sure what that means. You have to clarify a bit. Um, don't know what that means. Uh, I'm thinking about it, but I can't think of anything. Hi, Mike. Can you please analyze 827 Elias Street? Tommy, I wish I could. We just, we're just running out of time now. I'm trying to keep these to you know an hour, hour and a half in length. So next time, if you throw that, throw this question out next time, I promise I will take a look at 827 Elias Street um, and tell you what I think. Good luck in getting the HELOC. On rentals, better route is to refinance. Joe agreed. Yeah, you, I mean, the nice thing about refinance is you get cheaper debt. It forces you to take the capital out of the property and it forces you to use the capital. So if you've done a refinance, the money's in your account right away. You have to go invest that money. It forces you with the HELOC. You might say, oh, I don't want to pay the three and a half, four percent, five percent, whatever your HELOC's at, four and a half percent. I don't want to use that capital. Just sit there and you won't use it. Now there's some flexibility of having a HELOC and the Smith maneuver is nice from a tax perspective. You can directly determine where the capital is going. You can also take a refinance capital and invest it directly and still write off the interest on the personal property in which you live in. But yeah, I do think refinance is better. HELOCs, you can borrow typically 65% loan to value. Typical refinance, 80% loan to value. So you can pull more capital out of your property, higher percentage of loan to value. And it's cheaper, at least 1% cheaper to refinance the money and fix it in than it is to have a HELOC. HELOCs will be at like 4%, 4.5%, 5% now. And fixed mortgages are like between 2.8 and 4%, let's say, from an A, a lender, a prime lender. Thinking of refinishing an unfinished basement, he lists some links of resources that will help with code that I need to follow. Ontario building code is a little thick to read. Yeah, um, Sutherland, pass me some messages. Do some Google searching. You can pull out the, the Ontario building code. I've always been able to just look on forums too. Uh, if you have a specific question, like what is the, you could just type in like egress window specifications. It's 5.7 square feet. Of openable space that's required here in Ontario. You could Google that and isolate that information. Or fire separation, you can look at the different assemblies that will allow for proper fire separation and sound barrier, like resilient channeling, the rock salt safe and sound, and then the 5 8 fire rated Titex drywall is, for instance, one assembly that will work. There are other retrofit assemblies that are also as per the code. For instance, two half inch layers of drywall from a full inch layer of drywall will work in retrofit applications where you don't want to rip out the half inch drywall. You could just throw another sheet up and put green, green glue on it, and that will create a sound barrier as one example of an assembly that will work for fire or sound. There are different assemblies and different um, options. Always reach out to your local, you can call your local in, in the city. I'll call the, the building inspector and talk to them at a high level, give them nothing, no address or anything, and talk to them at a high level about the building code. And they will almost always answer your specific questions with the different types of assemblies you can get. So reach out to your local building inspecting division and talk to a local building inspector. Great points. I'm working on paying down debt. We did that question. Um, do you and your business partner have an agreement together if things go south and both of you were to separate? Kind of like a prenup. We don't specifically have something like that in place. Now we do have, we've had discussions about that and how things would transpire. We are both very reasonable individuals. We're both very wealthy individuals. And so the two of us would, uh, honestly, if we, we've had, but we did a bunch of joint ventures first and in all the conflicts that arose, we were able to find a common ground. And we make good partners because we're able to always find a common ground. And I'm a very reasonable person. He's a very reasonable person. The two of us would always find a reasonable, amicable solution because money is the most important thing. We don't let emotion get in the way of making profit. And so it makes the most sense financially, of course, to come to an amicable solution. And we're both smart. We both have similar driven goals. Now, things can always change. Businesses can depreciate. Um, they can, you, know, you can lose money. You can have net losses. 
um, assets can appreciate and which causes losses as well, artificial losses against real losses. And, and that's, when, that's when it actually matters. That's when you need to have a shotgun clause. Now we have that kind of stuff in our JV agreements. We have shotgun clauses there. Shotgun clause is effectively one person can offer someone X amount of money to buy the other person out. And the other person then has the right to accept that offer and or um, say, okay, buy me out at that price. And the reason that's good is because if I were to offer low to my said partner, he would just go ahead and buy me out at that price. If I offered him say hundred dollars to buy other company, he would say, okay, shotgun clause, I'll buy you, I'll, I'll buy the company out for hundred bucks. I'll buy you out for hundred bucks. So each person wants to give a fair price. No one ever gets kind of destroyed. And we both have good financial backing, so we could each buy each other out anytime. I don't see that ever being an issue. We're both very reasonable people. So that's what it comes down to. You want partners that are very amicable, very reasonable people. You don't want people who are emotional. You, you don't want to deal with people who have financial issues. I only partner, I like to only partner with people who have something to lose. If I'm partnered with someone who has nothing to lose, I mean, that's when you have real problems. If someone has something to lose, they don't screw around. So tip for business. I could go on about this forever, how to pick a good business partner. But um, yeah, okay. Uh, I'll keep going because we're running out of time. My daughter told me. Can we have that Excel document you're using? Yes, it's shared on my website and shared in the previous video, how to analyze a property. You can go into real estate and scroll down on my playlist. You'll see those two videos, descriptions in that video. And I walk through using this template in those two videos where I analyze a couple of different properties on MLS and properties that I've owned. How much sweat equity is needed and how do you estimate? So sweat equity is when you do the work yourself and you create equity in the property. If you're doing, if you're outsourcing all of the work, then it's totally different cost than if you're doing the work yourself. Um, so those kind of things. In this property, I talked about some of the spread that I would need, some of the margin that I would expect. Uh, hope that helped you, Tiger Rocks. As mentioned, could you just buy a home in cash or refinance after renovations? What are the pros and cons of doing this way? Yes, you definitely could. There's some total pros. There's no breakout fees when you put the new mortgage on. There's some distinct advantages to buying on unsecured line of credit or HELOC from another property or just in cash. Um, specifically being that you could put a new mortgage on and basically get all your capital back if you're smart about it. There are distinct advantages for closing quickly, getting a better discount. There are a lot of different sort of advantages you can, you can kind of use to kind of make sure that you're, uh, you're maximizing your capital. Keep it up. You're going to blow up. Tagger, appreciate that so much. Um, I really do appreciate those kind of comments. Keeps me motivated. Keeps me wanting to do this. Um, my energy level has been low today, guys. As I, as I said, I've only had a little bit of sleep and stressful, stressful days the last few days. How can I help this channel? Jackie Y 2.0. Um, send me a message on Instagram or, or Facebook. DM me. We can talk about ways that you could help. Maybe there's ways we can collaborate, stuff like that. Happy to do that. Thanks for all the super helpful information, Rick says. I was waiting all day for tonight's live stream. Now I can't wait for next Wednesday. Rick, thank you so much. Um, I really do appreciate that, guys. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. A lot of big changes have been happening in the company, um, in my personal life as well. A lot, of, a lot of cool stuff happening. We have some, some big plans, I think, for many of the different areas of the business. And I want to bring you guys better content. We're working on that every single day. Hope this added value to your guys' life. If it did, please smash that like button. Please share this. We want people to join the live stream. We want to have lots and lots of questions and lots and lots of insight that's shared between everyone. Um, sort of a collaborative thing. So if you guys have things you can share with me on here that I didn't know about, I'm happy to learn too. Because not only does this challenge me to think about the way that I do things and do them more effectively and efficiently, you guys also challenge me to be a better, better me. And that's what I'm asking you guys to do too. Is I'm challenging you to be a better you. Do 1% better. That's all I, every day I try to do 1% better at something. I'm always focusing on continual improvement. So anyway, that's what I got to talk about today, guys. I hope you really enjoyed this stream. Wise Wealth episode and show number 22, I believe. So the Wise Wealth show is now coming to an end. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Um, it's 8.30 now. So have a good night, everyone. As always, you know my catchphrase, spend less earn more and maximize your returns to unlock a wealth for you. Those are the only three levers you have to play with. So learn how to master those things in that order. And paying less interest is obviously spending less. Thanks guys. Bye everyone. Good to see you guys all on. Stop streaming.